The liberalization of the Indian economy in 1991 marked a new era of competition for Indian businesses. But there was one sector where competition was always there. This is the fast moving goods from toothpaste to hair shampoo and everything in between. The world's biggest international companies had been closely entrenched in the Indian market, dominating it. It is in this context that what Mariko and his founder Harsh Mariwala did was so significant. This company, which was set up in the early 1990s, carved a niche for itself as it created some of the most successful brands in the oils space, be it cooking oil or hair oil. In this episode of Shapers of Indian Enterprise, Harsh Mariwala take, talks about the art and the science behind the shaping of Mariko and Enterprise. Hi Harsh, good afternoon. It's very nice to have you on the show and I'm delighted that you agreed to be with us because we are covering a very important subject mm -hmm. of the building of uh, enterprise in modern India. Yes. Now you come from a very traditional family with yes. a very traditional business model and you built what to me appears to be a marvelous uh, FMCG company where I've also spent a large part of my career. Yes. Tell us some of your building blocks in making this journey. So, Gopal, good question. I, I never knew what I would do in, my, in terms of my career. When I joined the organization, I was just a graduate from Sydenham College in Bombay. And my father uh, said that join the organization. You don't need to study further. I couldn't, anyway, separately, I could not get admission into any MBA school in India. So I was, I joined. Bombay Oil Industries at that time, uh, traditionally managed, uh, family managed company in the heart of commodity markets in Masjid Bandar, which is very, very crowded, dirty. <laughs> um, so I was just let loose by my father, I said, okay, you do whatever you want to do. And in that uh, exploration, I visited uh, different parts of the business. We had three different businesses. We had an edible oil business, we had a spice extracts business, and we had a chemicals business. And both very different in terms of uh, whom we were catering to. There were no synergies between these three businesses. Um, so one or one year or so, I must have just spent time in visiting factories, customers. And in those explorations, I, I identified that if I was able to convert the edible oil business, which was unbranded, to a branded uh, business, it would be far more stable in terms of uh, growth as well as profitability. Uh, so with that in mind, I, I started touring in, inter in interior markets and that's how I built uh, the parachute brand. But the triggers of building these brands actually happened much, much earlier when I had gone abroad immediately after passing my graduation on a holiday and I saw a lot of branded goods in, in the supermarkets at that time. And then when I joined the organization, my uncle was talking about uh, the fact that we were supplying at that time coconut oil in, in, in tankers to, to Calcutta, uh, another player, a large player in Shalimar brand name. And they said that they used to saying, oh, you supply them in tankers, not tankers, in those 15 kilo no, tanks. tankers, railway tankers in loose. And they were packing it in their own containers and you know, so those triggers actually must have played an important role in my journey in terms of identifying uh, what to do. Separately, I, I'm not a technical person or my understanding of technology is, I would say, very poor. So thank God I had to, I went into a business which didn't require that much of technology in terms of manufacturing or distribution or marketing. And looking back, I think that was, happened out of just sheer, I don't know what you may say, serendipity or whatever, but it just happened and I think since then I've been passionately in love with this business. Mariwala left no stone unturned in establishing Parachute as a retail brand by improving the packaging, by investing heavily in marketing and in advertising. In those days, such oils were sold in square tins to wholesalers 
while Mr. Mariwala was keen on introducing plastic packaging, which was cheaper and would give a more premium look to his brand. But plastic was not used because rats loved coconut oil and could gnaw through the square plastic tins. Mr. Mariwala came up with a simple solution, round bottles, which would ensure that rats would not be able to get a grip on the plastic. The demand for those bottles saw a steady uptick. Fast forward to today, Marico has now become a market leader for its range of products. And I think this is my calling in terms of uh, suitable for my own strengths rather than trying to do something which is not based on one's strengths. Separately, uh, this sector has been heavily de-licensed from day one. So I have not been to Delhi in my whole journey, you know. So it didn't, I didn't have to ask for government uh, favours or entertain bureaucrats. Even before 1990? Before 1990, in, in early 70s. And I think that suited me ideally. I had to build my business on my own strengths. So that's how the journey began and you know, that's how we made these two brands. So Parish thinking back, Harsh, uh, there's a certain amount of serendipity which you have alluded to. And there was a certain amount of exploration. Yes, absolutely. You know, at the grassroots, absolutely. not at some high level yes, management yes. stuff. Yes, I mean, I just... My was element. that your own uh, wandering, if I may use that word, or was it something that the family arranged as a program for you? No, it was completely on my own. Uh, we had these two brands, but we were selling it mainly in big tins, 15 litre tins. Uh, they in turn were being sold loose by the dealers. And in certain parts of the country, we had those two, two, three small packs. It was selling well. So I think out of sheer curiosity, I went to those markets. And these markets were mainly in Vidarbha. So I remember going to Nagpur and then Nagpur, I took a car and traveled all the way to to Jalgaon and visited all the small, small towns, started appointing distributors. And even in certain locations where there were no hotels to stay in, I used to stay with the distributors at their houses. But it was sheer out of my desire to do something different, to establish a brand. And I think those days, I think that gave me a lot of good understanding of how retailing happens. That's, it's so nice to hear this. For me, it's evocative because yes. I began my career in the computer department of Hindustan Lever. Yes. And they sent me into the field to go and work, much Correct. like what happened to you, except I had a program. Correct. And I was given a train ticket to Nasik. Yeah. And I was booked in a place called Raj Mahal Hotel where the rent was six rupees per night. <laughs> and I did exactly the kind of things that you did. Yes. At that time, I was not at all happy. Huh. But I have to say, in hindsight, uh, I learnt a lot out of that. Oh, so the thrill I used to get, I Gopal, in terms of selling those few containers to a retail shop was something which I still remember. <laughs> okay, and made a sale happen. And has your sense of curiosity uh, about what other people are saying, in this case the trade, uh, what consumers are saying, has that stayed with you all these years? I would think so because I like uh, being in touch with consumers. Uh, there is a limit to, there are huge limitations to market research and I am not a very, very strong believer that all the answers come from market research. You have to personally interact with customers. So consumers, customers, you have to spend time, even the topmost person has to spend time because that's the only way you will be able to find out what the consumer needs and many times the consumers themselves don't know what they need. These are later needs which they have not realized that there is a certain opportunity for you to end cash on. So it's very important for every CEO to, to look at consumers and spend time on interacting with consumers and that's, to me, that's the most important part in any business. There's always a question, who comes first, uh, consumer or employees? My answer is clearly the consumer is the first person in any business. If the consumer is not there, what will the employees do? So in, today in Marico, now that you're a large uh, multi-billion dollar yeah. valued company, mm. uh, do you send your young people out to the field to repeat the Harsh Mariwala experience, but in a different sort of format and different way? Yes, I mean, we also have a similar program like Levers has now. It's called formalized through a management trainee program. So a lot of formal mechanisms have happened. We also have a consumer insiding manager and then we do con consumer insiding for different brands. We train people in consumer insiding. So yes, it is done in a far more structured manner now. 
but it still happens, at least in branding and sales. So if I have to draw out from that a lesson for our young entrepreneurs of the future, because this is all about building modern India, modern enterprise, you would say allow serendipity, curiosity and grassroots experience to be the soil on which you grow your young talent. Because that's what happened to you. Yes, that's the starting point. But and then more, most important is once you develop a certain proposition, you again test it out with the consumer. It's just not the first insight. You have to continuously go on testing so your that hypothesis. requires discipline. Yeah, so when you have a certain, you converted that consumer insight into a product. Test it out in terms of packaging, pricing, what the product, what the what it contains. So and then again fine tune that. Uh, even so, how do you find this balance between uh, creativity, curiosity on the one hand yeah. and the discipline of execution on the other? You, you, you are absolutely right. You know, at one level it looks uh, very different. But I always say that in innovation also at one level is highly creative. But if innovation has to succeed, it has to be very well executed. And that's where the systems, processes, uh, you know, follow-ups play a very, very important role. And if I look back at my own journey of converting, say, coconut oil, which was packed at that time in, in tins, to plastics, I used to spend every month, what is the plastic contribution of coconut oil to our total sales? And track it, have mechanisms, have incentives, uh, have advertising. So. I think that tracking played a very, very important role in that innovation succeeding. It's just not the ideation. Ideation combined with dialogues, converting it to a product and then executing it so that it results into something which is valuable for the organization. So that's a great lesson because what you're really saying is creativity has its place. Like when a child is two years old, three years old, it must be creative. But when he's eight or nine, he better have the discipline of going to discipline school. Discipline is very important, you know, and, and you, you need, need to combine, you know, so it's not either or, it's both. And they, they, you must use the right tool at the right time, yeah. if you want to really get innovation. Correct. Yeah. So tell me, you've done all this now for 50 years, uh, uh, and hopefully created a company which will be there another 50 <laughs> years or longer. Um, give our audience a sense of, I mean, I know Mariko well, hmm. but can you give a sense of the market capital, what is Marico worth today or how many employees work there because in all fairness, so, everybody may not be fully aware. So I, I'll just go back a little bit into my own history when I started, I mean, whatever we are doing currently, we hardly had any turnover and then we built it up, up to about 80 crores turnover in Bombay all days, which had different businesses and then I was able to advocate to the family that can you allow me to take this business into a different company. And that's how Marico was formed. In the first year of Marico, it was about 100 crore turnover. 1988? 1990, 1991, 100 crore turnover. And then this year we should cross about, I think, at least 9,500 crore turnover. Uh, we went public in the year 1996. And at that time, our market capitalization was 180 crores. I think today is it's about 75,000 crores. So in 25 years from 180 crores to 75,000 crores is the wealth we have created. Uh, I don't know what it means in terms of annualized growth rate, but it must be in the range of 20, 23, 24 percent. How many roughly. shareholders do you have? Well, today we have about two and a half, three lakh shareholders. So it's, but as promoters, we, we still uh, control the majority. Um, but it's, it's worked out well and it's, I think it's, it's done well in terms of its growth as well as in... So we don't hear all these stories of how your driver became a multi-millionaire or something. <laughs> you're saying there are three lakh people yeah. who have... You, they may be anonymous and not known in the media, but there are lots of people who have benefited out of uh, the Marico activity. I think so, yes. So that's a lovely story. That's what institutions are all about. To you, what does an institution mean? A business enterprise which is an institution. To What's the difference between an institution and a good company? Yeah, well, I, I think it's, uh, I don't have a theoretical definition, but uh, one thing is institutional has to be strong in terms of processes. And there are people, uh, people go on changing over a period of time, but the institution should survive over a period of time. So perpetuity in, in, in any institution is very, very important. So long, long life. Long life. Sustainability. And, and sustainability. And I don't want to see an institution which goes up in terms of in, in terms of business organization and institution which it has to go on increasing sales every year you don't want to be in a situation where one year is good next year is not good so both in terms of top line and bottom line you have to go on 
showing growth on a perpetual basis and also survive on a perpetual basis even if the promoter is not there. So tomorrow who can play that role, you know. So one is automatically the fact that it is, it is comprised of individuals who are, who are driven uh, and there is an internal strong talent pipeline and then the role of the board, you know. The board also can over a period of time play that role in ensuring that the institution's perpetuity continues in, in a healthy manner in terms of wealth creation and whatever else it has to offer uh, to all the stakeholders. So you've got a lovely bunch of uh, ideas in what you've just said and I want to explore mm -hmm. two or three of them because yes. that will be very useful for people who seek to build institutions in the future. But before that, can I just take you back one more before we get out of the nostalgia. Uh, the Indian consumer has changed dramatically. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, since I began my career and you began yours yes. about the same time, uh, today the number of retail outlets, the number of shops, the shopping habit, the method Absolutely. have all dramatically changed. Tell us two or three drivers that you were able to leverage. Two or three drivers of change, distribution outlets, consumer habits, so I think, urbanization. Uh, as you rightly put it, there are whole the whole environment compared to when we started has changed dramatically for example in the earlier days we used to sell mainly products to our retailers and to wholesalers through our own distributors and now then we started seeing the emergence of newer channels so whether it's the chemist channel or the modern retail outlets or the e-commerce channels and these are disruptors I, the way we look at uh, these disruptors is to can you have to embrace them rather than getting scared of them if you don't embrace them, then you are vulnerable in terms of private labels, in terms of they giving their preference to some other competitor of yours. So you have to proactively look at these as growth opportunities and you need a different structure to manage that. You can't have the same structure which manages your distributors handling e-commerce or handling modern trade. You create exclusive structures which are only catering to this disruptive elements in distribution and the same thing in the area of marketing when you were oh, those days only press was the main medium of advertising then press then radio came in after the radio television came in which became the largest medium advertising now we are saying that the digital uh, marketing is every year we are increasing our budgets I think I was told that we are almost spending 30 or 30 percent of our total budgets on digital and that's going to increase but am I the traditional marketer, can he manage or can he or she manage the digital market? The digital market, the answer is no, you need a different kind of profile to manage digital marketing. These are youngsters who understand this subject far better than you and me. So can you embrace these proactively and then ensure that you get, you make opportunities out of that. So our sales in the pandemic, for example, in, in the e-commerce have increased from 3% to 9% and uh, it's further likely to increase. We, the pandemic has given much more thrust to the overall digitization journey. And then we saw an opportunity in terms of creating new brands because overall awareness for health immunity increased dramatically. So we've launched a series of brands which are healthy foods. So we have Safola Masala Oats and then we launched our Safola Oodles which is our answer to healthy noodles. Uh, we launched Safola Honey, we launched Safola You also proteins. got a Safola High Protein Drink. We have high Which I have been drink. consuming. Oh, okay. I look fresh and healthy because of Safola. <laughs> <laughs> so these are newer opportunities which have opened up. So one has to go on tracking what are the opportunities opening up, not only in, as far as the consumers are concerned, but as far as the trade is concerned, as far as the distribution is concerned. And leverage them and, you know, proactively invest in them so that you look at these uh, this disruptors or the environmental changes from an opportunistic point of view. So you, the number of things that you have outlined in this, which I just, three of them I'd like to pick up. Yeah, uh, yeah. There are many more, but yeah. in the interest of time. One is there's an overlay mm. that you seem to emphasize mm. between intuitively learning what's happening out there and having systems and processes yes. to construct the problem yes. in a formal way so that a group of people can address it. So that's the first. The second I would like to pick up is uh, you talked about getting good people and talent. Yes. And the third I'd like to pick up is 
you said the role of the board and corporate governance. Yes. So can I take them sequentially? Yes, sure. Because yeah. if these seem to be your building yeah. blocks, the yes. stones, the bricks on which you built your house, yes. then I'd like to explore the three of them. Yeah, take so this balance between intuition and systems and processes. So I would say that it's beyond intuition. The starting point is to have an outside in approach of what's happening around the world. I see that many trends emerge in some other developing markets and they come to India over a period of time. So the whole trend towards e-commerce or the trend towards modern trade or recently the trend towards what is known as ESG, sustainability, environment and governance, environment, society and governance. All these trends have started in other countries and I think as top managers our role is to, to go on studying these trends. Even consumer trends or vegan, consumer trend of uh, having natural products. <coughs> these trends have started in, I went to US about 3-4 years back just to study these trends what's happening and what kind of new businesses are succeeding. So it's very important that as top managers, we study these trends because it's a matter of time these trends will come to India. And then at the right time, start investing in them, start creating structures. For example, in the ESG, we, we invested one full-time person in ESG three, four years back before the trend is actually accelerated. We are aware of the learning curve because we saw it coming. So I think the key thing is to identify these trends to some extent intuition also may play a role, I am not denying that. But ultimately, once you realize that yes, it is going to be a matter of time, it will come. Can you be an early uh, investor in that particular trend so that when it actually occurs, you are already ahead of the learning curve. So when you do this kind of thing, yes. you know, you can't get everything right. Yes. That's part of business. No, no, absolutely. Can you tell us one or two things which you didn't get right, which you which you overestimated and then you had to retract. Uh, at so, a I mean, many, many, many examples of failures. I, I strongly believe that uh, risk taking is a very inherent part of any entrepreneur's journey and that every entrepreneur has failures, but out of every failure, there is a learning. And out of every learning, there is a future in terms of future growth. Uh, I will take a new product example. Uh, in uh, We had identified uh, health trend, which uh, at, I put six or seven years back, where people were uh, wanting to lose weight and uh, Indians eat a lot of snacks. So we said that can we offer baked snacks instead of fried snacks. So we said that let's do it under the brand name Safola. Uh, it, because it was under Safola brand name, we felt that health was more important than taste. So we came out with a very healthy snack but not as tasty. We it didn't do well because for an impulsive category like snacks, taste is the most important thing, more important than health. And consumers were not willing to sacrifice their taste because it was a healthy product. We had to withdraw the product. Um, but the learning from that was that in future when we launch any food product, we have to give top priority to taste. So when we launched our Safola Masala Oats, we profiled the taste of each and every state and we developed a range of masala words specifically for that particular taste, a particular state. For example, in Tamil Nadu, we had a Pongal masala word. Uh, and that product has done exceedingly well. We, are, we have 80% market share. Within four or five years, we would do about this year, we would do about 150 crore turnover in Safala masala words. Uh, so it's so that what learning is the, came it's a in. Pongal of, made of words? No, no, it's a Pongal flavor. Ah, ha, ha, so it's okay. masala oats. So it's a right. pongal flavor. Right, right. right. So we have pao bhaji masala oats, we have a plain masala oats, we have tomato and pepper masala oats and things like that. So it, since you talked of ESG, yes. and you also talked about uh, taste in food, yes. and having spent so many years as I have in these same yes. similar sort of industries, you know the great enemy of the food industry, um, the great friend of the food industry who is an enemy of the public, hmm. are food, uh, fat, salt and sugar. Correct. How are you navigating this? Because without fat, so, sugar yeah. and salt, it's very tough to make a tasty food. I mean, we don't Yeah, but luckily we don't have any fried foods in our range of products. You know, we have a range of products where actually in our noodles also, you know, we have uh, made out of oats, the, our noodles. So far more healthy than, uh, than atta. Uh, there's no atta in it. Uh, so we, in our Packed foods or ready to eat or ready to cook foods, we don't have too much of fat or sugar. There is to some extent there is some element of salt but we try and keep it uh, as low as possible. 
you can't keep it very low so that the consumer will not touch it because it is not tasty. But we keep low salt options. And of course, our safola oils, which is mainly used um, for cooking and frying. We also give advice through our Safola Healthy Art Foundation that you have to control your oil intake. Uh, because if you consume it uh, in high proportions, it's not good for your health. Okay. Uh, I want to move away now from this uh, systems, processes, yeah, yeah. failure yeah. to the second subject of talent. Yes. Which you have mentioned a little while ago. Uh, not many people who set up, not many entrepreneurs talk about talent as being one of their top. You seem to be, if I've read your book as well. Yes. Uh, harsh Realities. There seems to be one whole chapter on Yes, talent. Yes. Tell us a bit, how did you stumble onto this? So, you know, if I look back at my own history and, you know, when I joined the organization, we had these two factories in Shivri and Mazgaon, mainly selling edible oils in bulk to paint industry, in big barrels, in tankers, in tins. And what I did over a period of time was converted that unbranded to branded without any capital investment. At the most, we must have invested in some filling machines, which was minuscule capital investment. All that had happened because of good quality talent, you know, because I was, I was a novice as far as my uh, studies were concerned and I had to learn, I learned, my whole learning has happened because of good quality talent. So I've learned maximum from people who have worked with me. So whenever we upgraded the quality of talent, I saw a discontinuous impact on our, on our growth and profits. So the belief of having very good talent just went on getting reinforced again and again and again when there were some vacancies and we were able to get a better quality talent. So when Marico started in 1990, I was so passionate about talent that this was the most important thing for us to do. If we have good quality talent, if you have the, a good culture, then automatically growth will follow because they will be far more effective in the marketplace. So the first employee we had in Marico was head of HR because I wanted to attract very good talent and that person was an MBA, had worked in Asian paints and no amount of me saying that we are a so-called professional company would have worked as much as coming from him and he had very good networks in the job market. So we were able to recruit very good talent uh, within a period of six months to one year when Marico was formed and since then uh, I have continuously looked at talent, uh, proactively look at talent in terms of improving a quality talent and that has paid off huge dividends. And I strongly believe that irrespective of business, what business you are in, talent would be the most important asset in any business and one has to proactively invest. And I find that many entrepreneurs, they don't look at HR, you know, they would say, okay, HR can be managed by somebody down the line because their perception of HR itself is wrong. Yeah, this is the big difference I'm seeing between what you're saying yeah. and what you've written in your book yeah. and what I see many other entrepreneurs doing because what you're really saying is if you understand that oxygen is required for the lungs, mm. that uh, cash is required for operations, yeah. then without talent, don't try to set up an enterprise. This You're giving it the same status and importance. Absolutely, yes. And why is it that such an obvious thing is not obvious to <laughs> entrepreneurs? I think many entrepreneurs look at, uh, you know, first of all, they play an important role in driving their own journey depending on the kind of stage at which the business is. So, of course, many entrepreneurs are very strong in marketing or finance or whatever they are doing, which will take them up to a certain stage. But at some stage when, you know, you can't do things on your own, you have to get it done from others. That is the time when talent uh, will play an important role. And then they start complaining, okay, I delegate it to somebody and see what happened. Mm. But you have not, you are not abdicating your responsibility. You can only delegate if you have very good talent. Mm. And that talent should be better than you in that particular, <laughs> their own functional area. So I think that's where there is a certain hesitancy from entrepreneurs because they think that they know it all. You know, what you're telling me uh -huh. reminds me of uh, what J.R.D. Tata used to say. Uh, I'm sure you've heard it. Uh, he didn't tell me that. Uh -huh. I and mean, I've also read about it. That uh, I found that I was not a trained engineer mm. to run a steel company or an automotive company. And I said, if I'm going to go out and get people, I better get people who are better than me. Absolutely. And once I've got people who are better than me, I better listen to them. Otherwise, why get them? True. And you're saying, this is the JRD I Tata fully formula. Agree. I didn't know about this, but I fully yeah. agree with what. Uh, so the Harsh Mariwala formula and the JRD Tata <laughs> formula seem to have some commonalities. I want to get to the last subject yes. of governance. Yes. 
uh, I do find many people, entrepreneur families, who are having independent directors because they need to have it under some section of the Companies Act. Yeah. You seem to make a virtue out of it. How come? Yeah, because I strongly believe that uh, board of directors, especially in a public limited company, is a source of competitive advantage. You know, if you recruit the right quality of board, we would know exactly what what is expected out of them. And then you raise the right issues, which are not many statutory issues, but strategic issues. And they also evaluate the talent pipeline in terms of the managing director, the CXOs. They can play a very, very important role. But uh, I think, unfortunately, many Indian promoters have not realized that they view board as something which... The, the burden, they have to carry. Burden, they have to protect uh, minority shareholders. Yeah, you have to do it, but that's not the main role of the board. The main role of the board is to act as a source of competitive advantage. And if you have that mindset, then automatically you will spend much more time in recruiting the right board and ensuring that the right issues are discussed in the board, you know. And now, increasingly, we are seeing that advisories are playing a very, very important role in driving all this. SEBI is also coming out with newer and newer regulations in terms of independence of in board members, gender diversity and things like that. So that's going to get a lot of traction over a period of time in future, at least. So there are, uh, it's also very important for the purpose of our viewers of this uh, particular program to keep pulling out the nuggets from time to time and I've taken out three nuggets and I'm restating it so that you can confirm. The first nugget I've got is, yeah, it's good to be grassroots and going out, but it's very important to layer it with systems and processes. Yes. The second nugget I've got out is, talent is about as important as oxygen is to your lungs. I'm using my words, but yeah, I think no, no, I I'm agree. not misrepresenting what you're saying. And the third nugget I've got is, the board is not a burden. It is an asset. Yes. It's a question of how you look at it. Correct. And if these three were followed, yes. do you think many more entrepreneurs can hope to build institutions? Of course, there are many other things they have to do right. But uh, do you think that's a good formula? I would say over a period of time, yes. One has to do it at the right time. The board can be done only when you're a public limited company. I'd, I would not want entrepreneurs to yeah. start looking at a board when they're very small because that will take unnecessary time and energy. So at the right time, Talent is something which is has to be there from day one, I would say. The first part which is com combination of intuition, outside in, personal inciting is, is important. And at some stage when the business grows, you have to convert that into systems and processes. And the board would be a little later when you reach a certain critical mass in terms of turnover and bottom line. So at some stage if in your organization journey, all three will be very important. You need to decide what stage what you want to integrate all these three. Uh, nuggets as you put it <laughs> in your own journey. So when I read your book and uh, in a sense I could sort of emotionally relate with certain parts of it. Mm -hmm. um, one other question comes to my mind which I would like you to comment upon. Uh, many entrepreneurs, I, I advise a few, they say I have no time to think of long term. <laughs> And you know, the day-to-day -day things absorbs yeah, me completely. Yeah, yeah. And I look at my daughters and my wife when she was, we were younger. Uh, mothers are all got the same problem. <laughs> you know, the child is crying, but the mother never stops dreaming about her, her, her child when she mm. grows up. In the act that you, action that you took mm. to find some nice way to surgically remove yourself from the family, yes, yes. Uh, you have balanced the short and the long term. Yes. Would you be able to share a few uh, nuggets? Uh, it's in the book, but... Uh, yeah, so I, I strongly believe that, you know, uh, your role has to change. You know, when you are small, you are doing things on your own as an entrepreneur. And when you start recruiting people, you're getting things done from others. And when you become really large, you are influencing others. So uh, every few years, I go on questioning what is my role, what it should be. What should I delegate so that I get enough time to look at future study future trends and I should not have a shortage of time as any excuse. I, I don't think ever in my own journey from zero base to today, I have said that I don't have time. Nor have I sat in my office ever in my, I don't think beyond 5.30 or 6 every day. Because you can ah, So you are breaking that. another myth. Ah. You are saying those who say they don't have time must rethink. It's an excuse. It's a, it's a, it's and an those excuse. who stick around in the office till 10 o'clock in the night must rethink. 
it's an effect, you know, something is not, you're not doing right in terms of not recruiting good quality talent. Okay, there may be some temporary failures sure. if you have some project coming up or something you may have to extend, but a lack of time is an effect of something you're not doing right, you know, either in terms of quality of talent or not delegating or not empowering. So you have to continuously go on evaluating how can you free yourself up and that will give you to, I mean, you will get newer experiences, you will learn much more because you are doing new things. I am not saying that you just give up something and enjoy life and do nothing, you know. You have to re go on reinventing yourself on a perpetual basis. So, yeah, I found it very interesting in your book that you have referred to um, the fact that there are big multinationals with big budgets and who can come and sort of you know, who can spend on advertising what your turnover for a year may be. Yes. Uh, and you had to find a strategy which I am describing from whatever conversations I've had as it's better to be a big fish in a small pond than to be a small fish in a big pond, right? That's an, uh, I know people who have the opposite view as well. Yeah. So there is a place for all sorts of views in this. But can you tell us a bit about that? So you're absolutely right. You know, it's a question of uh, your portfolio. What is your portfolio comprise of? And I strongly believe in those days, maybe I was influenced by Jack Welch's writing, number one or number two in each business. So my thinking was always that if I have to enter a new category, I should become a market leader. And today, if you look at our turnover, almost 95% of our turnover, in 95% turnover, we market leaders in that particular segment. Because if I enter but surely a large, that depends on how you define the segment. You are right. So, for example, in shampoos, now we are only present in anti-lice shampoo, where we are market leaders. I can't become a market leader against levers and proctors in, in the main shampoo category. And what is my right to win in that category? Because I am fighting global players who have so much more knowledge, they have so much of more research being done on that category that I will always be a side player. So, better to identify categories where I can become market leaders and uh, because of that I, I have a pricing power. I am not vulnerable to private labels in, in modern trade or as in e-commerce and they have to take me seriously. So. It has paid off good dividends because, you know, it is reflected in our profitability and we are not vulnerable to somebody else increasing prices or reducing prices when the raw material prices go up, you know. So, it has worked well for you to look for niche segments where you can be the big fish. Yes, but over a period of time, the niche segments of course. are not available. So, then you can say that, how can you innovate? For example, in the oats, I'll just give an example. When we entered Oats about four or five years back, we had the big players in Quaker and Quaker Oats and uh, uh, Kellogg's. So they were market leaders and we entered plain Oats. We got 10-15% market share, but then we started stagnating. <coughs> and then out of consumer insighting, we realized that Indians prefer savory breakfast. So can we do a Maggie in Oats? Uh, so we built up a whole range of Safola Masala Oats. And there we have 80% market share and because of that traction in masala oats and main, our market share in plain oats also has gone up. So if you combine both these, we are almost, we are number two, but we'll, the way we are going, we will be market leaders in, if you combine both plain as well as masala oats. So what I am trying to say is, you have to find opportunities by pioneering your initiatives. Many a times that segment is not existing. So we have pioneered many initiatives, you know, which are market leaders, whether it's Kaya Skin Clinics or masala oats or a brand like Revive, these were, or brand Safola itself, uh, we were able to identify a certain niche in terms of pioneering initiative which we have continued till now and we are still the market leaders. You know, though it's not the subject of our discussion, it just strikes me that if I look at national politics, okay. there are regional parties who are operating as big fish in a small pond. Yes. Because they are not able to take on Correct. Uh, something else which is dominant. So. There are other examples yes. outside the world of business yes. and it's an important factor that an institution builder must keep that it's not necessary to be the biggest guy, yes. but to be the biggest guy in a particular environment where you can exert influence. Yes. Great. Um, another question, that I, you got a whole chapter in your book, therefore it causes me to ask the question about culture building. Yes. And I'm trying to translate as I talk to you, mm. because we are talking of enterprise for mm. India in the future. Uh, how some of these lessons can be learned by others, even in national affairs, yeah. though that is not the subject of our discussion. What is this 
infatuation you have with culture, <laughs> if I may ask? So, again, driven by my initial uh, years in Bombay World Industries and, you know, whenever I experimented, I would go on experimenting in terms of openness, participation, what kind of leadership style I should have. And over a period of time, I developed certain belief that, you know, one should practice a certain leadership style and it should be uniform over a period of time in the organization. So when Marico began operations in the year 1990, we recruited something like 30, 40 senior managers from different backgrounds, people coming from multinationals, from Tata's, from Asian Paints. And each one was exhibiting a leadership style which was based on their own past. past. And it was sending such strong conflicting signals within the organization that I said I have to define what we stand for, uh, what is our belief in terms of people, what is our belief in terms of products, in terms of profits. And I started writing down some random thoughts I had uh, developed over a period of time, some 30-40 pages, and I shared with my team. And that's how the journey in terms of identifying values began. And we were able to craft our values. We got Professor uh, Brutyanjay Atreya to help us in terms of uh, converting those values into culture because defining values is easy. I want to be innovative, I want to be open, I want to be whatever, participative, I want to trust, I want people to take risks. But how do you convert that on a perpetual basis so that it becomes a very strong culture and the way things are handled within an organization? So I didn't want values to people becoming cynical down the line that this is something which is just meant for a show. So we spent a lot of effort in the first two, three years in terms of inculcating these values to all our members. And since then, every new manager goes through a values uh, session, one full day value session. It's very important that we create in reinforcers within our values and beliefs which will continue, make us continue that culture of openness, transparency, of empowering, of innovative. And I'm happy to say that we still continue to do that. We measure our values every year at all our corporate locations. So culture building takes time. It takes three to five years. And, and it's worth the effort. It's fully worth the effort because culture on one side and strategy on the other side is a beautiful blend. You know, it, it, culture helps you succeed better in strategy in terms of, for example, innovation. And each, depending on the kind of business one is in, you have to identify what values, culture you need so that the business will benefit, you know. So I think that's helping us a lot, especially in the pandemic times. Amazing kind of, you know, because we are highly empowered organization. Things were just happening on its own. People sitting at home and our factory started operating after the lockdown was announced within a week or so. So I'm saying culture is a source of competitive advantage. It's, it goes hand in hand with strategy. Do you measure employee engagement? in your Yes, yes. Every, I think every few months, every two, three months. And we have, we have beating, just two days back, I asked the HR heads, what are the, so we, we are beating global benchmarks in terms of the engagement levels. So there's another aspect of your book, uh, of your practice, I should say. I'm not sure this is in your book. Um, you know, many business families think that my father started this, I have taken it over, my son must take over and so on. You seem to be, I'm not sure what your future is, but that's not the subject of uh -huh. our discussion. You seem to have a different view. So uh, you're absolutely right. You know, when uh, it was time for me to, or when I decided to step down, I, I had a choice of my son uh, taking over from me. And society also expects that. My wife expected that. So it was, I mean, so deeply ingrained in the Indian society that uh, the son will, will succeed the father. But by then the business had grown a lot. And, you know, uh, I strongly believe that each person is born with certain God-given gifts, certain strengths. In my son's case, he wanted to establish something on his own uh, rather than inheriting something from me. So... And he was a bit young at that time also, and this happened six years back. Uh, he decided to set up an investment office, which is, has been his calling, and, and he's done exceedingly well in that area. And now he can proudly claim that this is something which I have done on my own, without my father's kind of a, uh, you know, I have not inherited or I have not succeeded my father. And I strongly believe that in future this is going to happen more and more, because ultimately the right person should should manage the company, the organization's interest should come first, followed by family's interest. Because most other promoters, entrepreneurs, they think the family's interests come first and then the interest of the company. But that's not sound. So this is a huge mindset change. If you want to build enterprises for the future in modern India, family second, enterprise first. Yes, absolutely. 
you are very clear on that absolutely clear and we'll see increasingly that as competition increases if if families don't behave like that the business can get destroyed because of increasing competitive environment i know it's a speculative uh, question but i'm asking for a speculative answer looking ahead at a time maybe 2040 50 maybe some of us won't be around how do you see the indian market developing so i see uh, i'm very positive on the indian market uh, of course one is talked about demographic dividend the size of population but i think most importantly the whole penetration of uh, smartphones mobiles digitization i think our investments in digitization is going to show a big big impact on our overall growth to me i am most bullish about that i am bullish about the fact that there is the urbanization is increasing i am bullish also about the fact that the gender part in terms of women working is going to add a lot of wealth uh, to our overall journey the the millennial customer will exhibiting different trends in terms of buying habits all in all i am i am very positive of course the journey on on reforms has to continue we still need to do much more whether it's judicial reforms or administrative reforms or or the ease of doing business but all in all i am presuming that all that journey will continue ultimately the owners of driving economic growth goes back to entrepreneurs it, you can't go on expecting the government to drive economic growth they have to create the environment and ultimately the entrepreneurs should drive growth and i am very optimistic about the fact that we have a very strong entrepreneurial uh, culture and we will if if they are freed from more and more of government controls and rules and regulations we will thrive much more in future so you are seeing an increasing space for private entrepreneurs yes in the growth of the national economic pie it's a lesson we have learned over 70 years through yes. various uh, twists and turns yes but that is what gives you the great confidence absolutely yeah and therefore whether it happens in 2025 or 2035 5 trillion 10 trillion india's got a very good road ahead there'll be some twists and turns some pluses and minuses your know, the role of entrepreneurship enterprise and building long term institutions to you is a very crucial part of india's future development absolutely yeah. uh, absolutely right yeah. it's a great pity now that hardly 25 companies account for i don't know 60 70 80 percent of the market cap yeah. of our stock exchange yeah. what can we do to make it 2000 companies should account for so i think we are seeing trends in all the unicorns which have increased in the last one year the number of unicorns which have happened are huge and that itself is raising aspirations of so many youngsters you know they are seeing individuals coming without any business background family background and becoming unicorns look at the nikes of nike you know falguni nair was working in kotak bank without any experience in e-commerce has created a business market cap likely to be in the range of 6 to 8 billion dollars amazing and so, profitable at that profitable so we are going to see many more individuals looking at such individuals who have created such successes we are just going to have multiplier effect i'm sure about it so the future for our children is going to be very bright yes except that we have to be far more careful on the environment sustainability issues which is worrying Uh, the role of the government on on the social side also is very important education is important healthcare is important i think that's where it has to go hand in hand with uh, with the growth entrepreneur growth great harsh i think we've had a lovely conversation uh, i'm so happy that uh, you're so positive people think i am very positive but i think if you're not positive you can't lead life in india absolutely you have to be positive yes. but i think you've given us very good nuggets as to why you should be positive and how the signs are there it is not that it's a dream yeah, yes and uh, i hope this series will help our young entrepreneurs see how modern enterprise has been built in india in the last 50 years and how it can be further developed in the next 50 years thank you so much thank you gopal thank you for having me